During the 1940s and early 50s, David Ritchie, better known as Dave Sands, dominated boxing, winning the Australian light middleweight, middleweight and heavyweight titles, as well as the British Empire middleweight championship. At his peak, he was the world's number one ranked middleweight, but never got to challenge Ray Robinson for the world title, some say because the Americans did not want to lose the championship. At the age of 26, Sands was tragically killed in a road accident near Dundog in 1952. Today, his son Dave Jr. unveiled the monument, which was erected by the boxing fraternity. Present were many past boxing greats from as far back as the 40s, up to the champion Waters brothers of today. Sands' wife and children also attended, as well as his brother Clem, who is the sole surviving member of the famous six boxing Sands brothers. The man behind the monument, Cess Perkins, says the only memorial to Sands before today was a plaque on a local grandstand which has suffered the ravages of time. He was always an idol to me and he always will be. Must be a special uh, day for you and also his family then. Oh yes, I think so. I hope so anyway. As I said, uh, uh, there's, uh, there's more than one person that uh, got their heads together and brought this to, a, uh, to the stage of where it is today. And... Uh, you know, I, I think we've got something here we can be proud of. Not only Stockton, I mean, we love it here because it's in Stockton, but uh, the whole of the boxing fraternity, uh, Newcastle, they're all part of it in their own little way, unbeknownst to a lot of them, they've been contributors towards it. Australia's 28,000 coal miners will consider extending their two-day strike unless Colliery owners back down over plans to alter award conditions. 150 mines in New South Wales and Queensland are affected. The stoppage was called on Friday to protest against the actions of two Hunter Valley companies. Walkworth and BP's Northern Operations have applied to the Coal Industry Tribunal to vary the award. At the hearing of BP's application last Wednesday, the Coal Owners Association threw its weight behind the plan. The miners saw red, claiming the move flew in the face of negotiations taking place at a national level and that owners were backing it as a test case. Miners at Walkworth and BP are out on strike indefinitely and at a meeting last Friday, they made it clear they would be calling for extended national support unless the owners withdrew. The Miners Federation met with State Mineral Resources Minister Ken Gabb today. Tomorrow busloads of miners will attend the hearing of Walkworth's application before the tribunal in Sydney. Hunter delegates will meet on Wednesday to discuss the outcome of the hearing. They will then call a mass meeting at Brankston. Last night, Hunter Ambulance Officers gathered at Hamilton headquarters. The issue at stake was staffing. Ambulance Officers say the Health Commission has rejected their claim for four extra staff. The Ambulance Officers say their staffing request is conservative. I heard over the phone just ten minutes before I went into the meeting that uh, three out of the four positions had been refused. We were after a man on night shift at Nelson Bay. At present, up there, there's only a man on call. Uh, we wanted two extra positions in the control room. Uh, at night, there is only one man in that control room at night. And uh, in a city the size of Newcastle, with the potential for industrial accidents and uh, those sort of disasters, um, we feel that there should be a minimum of two men in there to handle uh, that sort of workload. And the fourth position is uh, a transport officer that we've been after for some time. The only one that we got was a position in, in the control room, an extra man on the afternoon shift on Saturday. Uh, the other three have been refused. In a move designed to get the Health Commission to reconsider, ambulance officers voted to answer only emergency calls with the exception of renal patients and the waterfront Kooragang standby units. This industrial action will have considerable impact as the service carries out about 50 to 60 non-urgent transportations each day. These include people going for physiotherapy, radiotherapy and non-urgent medical transfers.
49-year-old Austin Brooks has been climbing for 30 years. For the last 18 months, he's been running and rock climbing in preparation for the highlight of his climbing career. In 10 days, he departs to lead a 24-person assault on Mount Everest. The Australian Bicentennial Everest Expedition was conceived in 1981. At that time, no Australian had reached the summit of Mount Everest. That changed in 1984 when two Australians made the top. Another earlier attempt ended in tragedy, however, when two climbers died in a combined New Zealand-Australian expedition. Mr Brooks says he has not ignored the dangers. It's caused me to think several times, but I, I guess it hasn't put me off in the end. Um, mostly because, apart from other spells of frostbite, so far all the expeditions I've been on, we've all come back alive. Uh, I guess if someone were to die, it might change my mind, but... Um, it hasn't so far. Uh, well, it'll be winter when we the expedition arrive, so is costing three hundred thousand dollars, with each team uh, member contributing at least five thousand dollars to help cover the costs of the specialised uh, high-altitude equipment. The Nepalese the government have granted the team permission to climb via both the usual South Col and the more difficult West Ridge. Mr. Brooks says everything at the moment points to a successful attempt before the monsoon begins in May. Well equipped, a good, big, strong team. Um, all I guess we need is a, a bit of luck with that, that weather towards the end of May. Now, how much difference can that make? Ah, it's crucial. Uh, in 85 we didn't get two consecutive days of fine weather. Um, we just didn't get above 26,000 feet. We had two camps buried in avalanches. Uh, and I guess it was a write-off. We were lucky to get out. Um, this time, if we get the weather, we'll get to the top. Have you had much support from... The The incident was investigated by detectives attached to the Corrective Services Department. Maitland Police say the detectives today charged two prison officers aged 35 and 49 following an incident four nights ago. It's alleged a 24-year-old prisoner was assaulted in his cell by officers wielding a baton, causing lacerations to the man's scalp and bruising to his body. Police say the prisoner was treated at Maitland Hospital on Saturday. The Department of Corrective Services says following the incident, a special response group used to quell riots was brought to Maitland from Sydney on standby in case of violence. The last few days have been calm, but according to the department, a team of up to 10 men is still stationed in the Maitland area. Meanwhile, prison officers who are members of the Public Service Association have called a meeting at 8 o'clock tomorrow morning at the jail. They will consider the charges against the two officers and the possibility of... The station is manned from 7 in the morning until 11.30 at night, but if officers are out on patrol or in court, they're forced to lock up the premises. Ideally, residents want the station open 24 hours a day, but failing that, they think an officer should be in the building during work hours at all times. Neighbourhood Watch at Carrington has been very successful since it was introduced last year, but the group says a criminal element still exists. Uh, we're concerned at some of the vandalism of the night time around the area. Uh, there is a certain amount of hooligans that run around uh, and for that reason we think that there should be extra police required. The police say they do not have a staffing problem at Carrington, but they admit they've received many complaints from residents who want the station manned and open seven days a week. But the station cannot always be manned both morning and afternoon shifts on the weekend, while overnight the area is patrolled by squad cars. We have detectives out on the road, we have members of the district anti-theft squad out on the road. So there are police in the area at most times. There are 600 homes in Carrington and their neighbourhood watch group is now collecting signatures to petition the state police department to consider appointing more officers.
Newcastle public servants have voted overwhelmingly for an end to the two-tier wage fixing system. The PSA members also accepted a revised 4% wage offer to stop work meeting this morning, a move that's likely to be reflected statewide by public service meetings. For all the news, join us tonight at 6. Good afternoon, I'm Helen Hughes. Prison officers at Maitland Jail are on a 24-hour strike. The industrial action was called to protest at four officers being charged with assaulting a prisoner. For all the news, join us tonight at 6. Hello, I'm Ross Hampton. In tonight's news, a new lease of life for one of Newcastle's oldest military establishments. The gun emplacement on Shepherd's Hill, neglected for years, is being resurrected as part of a Commonwealth employment program. For all the news, join Got us it? tonight at 6. met for two and a half hours this morning. The meeting was called yesterday after two warders, aged 35 and 49, were charged over an incident last Friday night. It's alleged a 24-year-old inmate was assaulted in his cell by officers wielding a baton, causing lacerations to the man's scalp and bruising to his body. Today's meeting was told detectives attached to the Corrective Services Department had summoned two more officers to appear in court to face assault charges on the same prisoner. The officers voted to go on an immediate 24-hour strike and to fill in their resignation forms, claiming their colleagues were being victimised. We believe that there is a conspiracy by prisoners within Maitland Jail to have discipline and good order that is now maintained at Maitland Jail broke down to something that they, to where they can run the jail. That is, the prisoners are on the jail. So you're saying that the prisoners are setting officers up? I'm saying that exactly, yes. I think there's only a small number of it, of prisoners in on the conspiracy, headed by one in particular. A reliable source says the man at the centre of the allegations is Tom Domican. The former ALP identity is in jail awaiting trial. He is charged with the attempted murder of hitman Christopher Dale Flannery and with various offences arising from the Kalasic affair. Prison officers plan to meet again tomorrow morning. In their absence, police are on duty at the jail. The Department of Corrective Services says a special anti-riot group is also on standby in the Maitland area. Meanwhile, the four prison officers charged with assault are due to appear in Maitland Court on Friday. That's when the mass resignations will be tendered. Australia miners returned to work this morning, ending a 48-hour strike. The strike was in protest of colliery owners' plans to alter award conditions by applying to the Coal Industry Tribunal. This morning, delegates from Mines in the Hunter Valley met to consider the state of the industry and to work out a plan of action, depending on the outcome of talks in the Coal Industry Tribunal. When the Tribunal, David Duncan's determination came down, it mainly provided a strategy for getting the parties back to the negotiating table. He said he doubted the capacity of the parties to negotiate on district or national issues, but he ordered the immediate resumption of mine site discussions and the lifting of bans and limitations at the mines. If the unions comply with these directions, he said it would then be appropriate to do as the unions request and not allow the matters to proceed before the tribunal while negotiations continued on national or district matters. Unions will consider the tribunal's decision on a national basis in Sydney on Friday. A decision will be made at this meeting about whether miners at Walkworth and Howick should return to work.
Hello, I'm Jane Button. Tonight I'll be reporting on continuing disquiet at Maitland Jail. Prison officers met again today and are particularly concerned at the prospect that two warders might be suspended while their cases are heard. For all the news, join us tonight at 6. Nelson Bay's $1.4 million polyclinic will be officially open next week, but with no doctors to treat the area's patients. Local general practitioners are refusing to work under the proposed wage conditions, a stand that has angered those who have fought hard to establish the medical centre. For all the news, join us tonight at 6. After an eight-year battle, the Nelson Bay Polyclinic is a dream come true, but one that might turn into a nightmare. Doctors say the problem has been festering for the past eight months during the centre's construction. They claim under the original contract, casualty services performed by ten on-call local practitioners would be paid for by the government for a set fee of $15 per call. Spokesman Dr Arne Sprogas today said that all doctors involved supported the new medical centre and wanted to work at the polyclinic, but not under such low pay conditions, preferring the award sessional rate. He said many doctors would lose out financially, like their country colleagues. The 12-bed polyclinic will operate as a unit of the Greater Newcastle Area Health Service and Chief Executive Officer Dr Owen James today said that previous meetings between the doctors uh, the concerned and the health department so had failed to agree on the pay issue, but he was confident negotiations would continue. An Luckily avid supporter of the polyclinic the from the start, the member and, for Newcastle uh, Arthur Wade says he is angered over the doctor's latest stand and has made overtures to other doctors to staff the clinic. I've spoken to, the, uh, to members of the uh, Doctors' Reform Society in Sydney this morning in the hope that we may get a group of those to come up, set up business in, in Nelson Bay. I can provide them with uh, clinical space and uh, they'll bulk bill and it will undermine the arrogance of the present setup of doctors in Nelson Bay. The weekend raid has brought new notoriety to a practice the RSPCA has been fighting for decades. Although the owner of the track will face charges for the alleged use of live rabbits on a greyhound lure, the racing industry has announced plans for its own inquiry. Local RSPCA officer John Carter says the industry has been too slow taking action. A few years ago we've been giving information to the Greyhound Control Board to clean up their industry and let them do it, but they haven't. So now, it's, uh, if they're not going to clean it up, the RSPCA will. And the RSPCA would also like to see more support given to the so-called fight-back lures which simulate a live rabbit without the suffering and bloodshed. Electronics expert John Senior this says dog trainers are showing more interest in a lure track. system he's developed uh, over the past 15 years. The in the dog's mind, it functionally does the same thing because uh, the fight-back creates the illusion that the skin that the fight back at, that the dogs attack is alive.
Water Resources Minister Janice Crozio put the working model into action today at the Regional Museum. It was built by apprentices from the Hunter District Water Board during the past 12 months. The model will be loaned to the Newcastle Museum until the end of the year and will then be displayed in other museums and exhibitions. The model cost $55,000 to produce. The Electricity Commission, which once leased the Walker site, contributed $25,000. The Walker Waterworks at West Maitland provided the first permanent water supply to the Lower Hunter and operated from 1887 to 1925. The fifth annual Hunter Community Volunteer Programs presentation of awards ceremony was held at the program's headquarters in Cowper Street. Ten awards were also presented to representatives of community organisations who have helped train volunteers and ensured they gained the maximum benefit from their involvement. The program has almost 300 unemployed volunteers throughout Newcastle, Lake Macquarie and Port Stephens. Recently, many have found paid jobs in areas they once worked voluntarily. Program managers say those nominated for awards today have been outstanding volunteers. Points considered in making selections were contribution to the community, reliability and attitude, and efforts made to gain paid employment. Many in the area believe the waterways should be the principal election issue for the Great Lakes. Yesterday the association organised a public meeting asking the candidates to outline their plans for the waterways. Feelings about the lakes run high. Locals made the most of the opportunity to make some pointed protests. Liberal candidate for the seat Bob Graham says his government would demand much of the lake's major tenant. We would make Elcon pay for their 25 years of neglect rape and desecration of the system. But sitting member for Gosford and Labor candidate for the new electorate of the entrance, Brian McGowan, says Labor would fund the lake's clean-up dollar for dollar with We're the council. prepared to cooperate with Wyong Shire Council on a dollar for dollar basis. Now that doesn't mean that the ratepayers have to pay, it just means that the funds that they get from government lands should be put towards the lakes. But if those funds are going into the lakes, wouldn't that mean that the council would have to cut back on other services? No, under section 352 of the Local Government Act, they are required to spend it on foreshores. It was a day of intermittent rain for the first of the Round Robin State Challenge Cup. The newly merged Newcastle Austral Soccer Club was out to prove that this season they'd be a force to be reckoned with. Their first game was a clash with Manly Warringah. And right from the outset, the home team showed superior technique. Brett Porter particularly shined. Twelve minutes into the game, he scored this goal with a well-placed header. He then went on to score the fourth goal and made it a hat-trick with the fifth. Eddie Boards, Newcastle Austral's director, was clearly excited by the result, but says the team's real form won't be known until they have clashed with one of the top Sydney teams. Well, the result today is certainly important to us. First of all, the, the guys on the park had a chance to perform. We mustn't get carried away by it because we've got uh, a long season ahead. It's encouraging, and Willie's quite happy about the result, so uh, we are too.